The plan for the attack on Panama had not been entirely discarded, and it was intended that submarines Wine 400 and 401 should carry out a dawn attack on Ulithi and then proceed to Panama after recovering their aircraft. The attack on Ulithi was planned for August 25. The submarines leaving Truk at the beginning of that month on August 16 came the end of the war. Nothing was ever achieved by these 3,500-ton craft. They were the largest of their kind in the world. Three and a half years of planning and design in vain, Captain Arizumi, the senior officer, shot himself just before their arrival in Yokosuka at the end of August. In 1946, both I-400 and I-401 was taken to the United States of America by the United States Naval Authorities. The third ship of the class, I-402, was completed immediately before the war ended, but she had been converted during building to a fuel carrier. In July 1945, I-58 was ready again for active service. We were ordered to leave Cure on the 16th to harass the enemy's communications. We left harbour to the strains of martial music amid a host of cheering voices and set course through the swept channel. We spent one night off the Khitan base and held a special ceremony to mark the coming ordeal of the Khitan crews. There were six of these brave men on board. The next morning we proceeded to sea, escorted out by a score of motorboats. We carried out deep diving trials at the entrance to the Bungo Channel, but the periscopes of the Khitans were found to be defective and we had to return to base to change them. However, we got away again on the evening of the 18th and proceeded southward through the Bungo Channel, zigzagging at high speed for fear of enemy submarines. A submarine on the surface has no means of dealing with a submerged enemy, and all she can do is to make a dash for it on the surface, hoping no enemy aircraft appear. Provided the submarine is equipped with air and surface radar as she goes along, she can pick up the enemy's outline on the surface, obtain his position and course, and so take avoiding action. At daybreak, enemy submarines were likely to dive, and so were we, resulting in a stalemate. At night, both boats will surface and repeat the same cat-and-mouse performance. In this manner, it is possible to negotiate with safety waters where enemy submarines may be lurking. At times, therefore, we were able to proceed at high speed on the surface toward the enemy lines of communication. That night we picked up on our radar something that appeared to be a B-29 formation, probably going to attack the Japanese mainland. One wondered what city was in for it that night. The moon was growing brighter, and we had already reached the area on the Saipan-Okinawa route where we might expect to fall in with the enemy. As usual, we toasted the Khitan's crews at the evening meal. I explained the general situation to them. Our orders were to attack enemy ships off the east coast of the Philippine Islands. I-53 had sailed with us. She was to patrol the area east of Okinawa. There was nothing to be seen except a wide expanse of ocean. We decided to lie in wait at the point where the enemy routes from their major bases at Leyte, Saipan, Okinawa, Guam, Palau and Ulithi converged, but we fully realised that even so we might miss our chance in such a wide area. However, we had the Khitans and were determined to sink any boat that came our way. We arrived on the Okinawa-Saipan route, but still there were no signs of the enemy. The sea was calm under a bright moon. Conditions were excellent, but not a single target came our way. We had no better luck on the Okinawa-Guam route. It was then full moon on the 22nd, with conditions suitable for attack by day or by night, we proceeded at speed to the Leyte guam route. The moon was waning, and our best chance was fading away. I went to pray at the ship's shrine. On July 27, according to instructions, we arrived on the guam Leyte route and made it to the west. At 5.30am on the 28th, an enemy aircraft showed up on the radar and at once we dived. By this time our radar equipment had improved and we no longer had to worry about being surprised by enemy aircraft. At 2pm we came up to periscope depth and to my great joy, inspection revealed a slowly approaching three-masted ship. It was a large tanker. At last we were face to face with the elusive enemy. The enemy appeared to be unaware of our presence. As we watched a destroyer come into sight, this made the situation less simple. As we dived to creep in closer, I gave the order, Catons prepare for action, all tubes to the ready. Our hydrophones were not functioning well, 
making it unwise to approach within torpedo range because we couldn't be sure of the destroyer's whereabouts, so I decided to use the chitons. Numbers 1 and 2 chitons. Stand by number 1 was a little slow and I decided to launch number 1. I gave them the enemy course and speed by telephone at 2.31pm. Number 2, Kayton started her engines and reported ready. I gave the order to launch number 2. The last securing band had slipped and she set off on her way toward the enemy tanker. Ten minutes later, one was ready. Her officer shouted three cheers for the Emperor and was off. Both Kaitans seemed to be running well. There were the usual South Sea squalls about, but we could still see the target quite well. But no explosion was forthcoming. Anxiously, we kept watch through the periscope. Finally, the tanker disappeared from view. About 50 minutes after the launch of number two Kaiton, the sound of an explosion was reported, and ten minutes later another one. We surfaced, but a squall obscured everything. Our thoughts were with the men who had so recently been with us, and we prayed for their happiness in a future existence. It was our tenth day out of Kure, and our supply of fresh vegetables had been given out. There were a few onions still left, but otherwise it was just tinned food from morning till night. Our tinned vegetables were particularly unpopular except for a kind of parsley. There were also plenty of tinned sweet potatoes. They were generally held to taste of sand or ashes. Continuing our patrol, we made off for the intersection of the Leyte Guam and Palau Okinawa routes. July 29 was cloudy and the weather mostly bad, but it wasn't rough, and we continued on the surface toward our objective. We had complete confidence in our four large binoculars and air and surface radar and were firmly convinced that we would spot the enemy before he spotted us. We were apprehensive only of enemy submarines in good visibility, but otherwise we were confident that we would not be exposed to an unexpected attack. Both crew and armament were first class. If only our submarines had had radar two years earlier, we would not have incurred so many losses and would have had more submarines for current use. I thought I would continue on the surface, but toward nightfall the visibility deteriorated, and by about 7pm it was almost nil. We decided to wait for the visibility to improve and dived to await the moonrise at 10pm. After diving, the chief engineer came to inquire how soon we should be surfacing again. He was anxious to make minor repairs which had been impossible to tackle while he had been running on the surface almost continuously. He was glad to have the opportunity of two hours' work before moonrise. I raised the periscope to check what was happening, but it was pitch black and I could see nothing. Leaving orders to be called at 10.30pm, I went to lie down on my bunk in the wardroom. The vessel was moving slowly westward at a submerged speed of two knots, with an underwater displacement of 3,000 tonnes. All was silent in the dimly lighted boat, except for the sound of the air conditioning plant and the characteristic sound of the hydroplanes and rudder movements. Two-thirds of the crew were turned in. They slept completely naked on top of the torpedoes, on top of the rice sacks or between shelves. The boat was a modern one, and the cooling plant therefore pretty good. The remaining third of the crew were on watch, with the engine room staff carrying out minor repairs. One must not forget the rats, of which there were plenty. They were a perfect plague, and it was impossible to keep them down. At the moment they were scampering about the kitchen and making an awful row. At 10.30pm, the petty officer of the watch came to call me, reporting all well. I donned my uniform and, having paid a visit to the boat's shrine, mounted the conning tower. The officer of the watch had nothing to report and, wishing to raise the periscope to have a look round, I ordered night action stations. By then it was 11pm and, about an hour after moonrise, my eyes became accustomed to the darkness. I ordered 60 feet and increased speed to three knots. When we came up to the correct depth, I ordered the night periscope to be raised just clear of the surface and quickly took a look round. The visibility was much better, and one could almost see the horizon. The moon was already high in the eastern sky, and there were few clouds in its vicinity. It was nearly half moon, and the light good enough for a submerged attack. Raising the periscope gradually till it was well above the surface, I made a careful search two or three times, but there was nothing in sight, and I decided to surface. I ordered, Stand by Type 13 radar, this was our search set for aircraft. Then I ordered, Stand by Type 22 radar, our surface radar. 
The receiver rose above the surface, but there was no aircraft reaction. The radar operator had gone through special training, and his technical skill was far above the average. Having decided that there were no enemy aircraft about, we surfaced to look for the enemy, and I ordered action stations. The alarm bells rang, and the crew came running up to their stations. The boat suddenly became a hive of activity, and in a minute or so came the report. Crew closed up at action stations. Having housed the periscope handles, I gave the order. Surface and blow main ballast, high-pressure air was admitted to the main tanks the water was expelled, and the boat quickly rose to the surface. As soon as the upper deck was awash, the order was given to open the conning tower hatch and the yeoman of signals, who was standing by, opened up and climbed onto the bridge. He was followed by the navigator. I myself was watching through the night periscope. The surface radar set was ready to go into action. When fresh air began to come in, we changed to the low-pressure air pump for expelling the water in order to conserve high-pressure air. At that moment, the navigator shouted, bearing red 90 degrees, a possible enemy ship. I lowered the periscope, made for the bridge, and turned my binoculars in the direction indicated by the navigator. Without doubt, there was a black spot which was clearly visible on the horizon on the rays of the moon. I ordered, dive. At this order, the four people on the bridge scrambled down the ladder, the signalman last, shutting the hatch and reporting it closed. I was at the periscope in which the black shape was clear. I ordered, open the vents, the water came into the tanks and the boat started to go down. I kept my eye glued to the periscope so as not to lose sight of the target. The boat was soon fully submerged. The whole operation was so much part of our life that it went as smoothly as a reflex action. As soon as we were fully submerged, I gave the orders. Ship in sight, all tubes to the ready. Catons, stand by. It was 11.8pm. After diving, we altered course to port, and the black shape was now right ahead. I was still watching through the periscope, from time to time scanning the rest of the field of view, but there was nothing else in sight. Gradually, the supposed enemy seemed to be getting closer. We were ready to give a salvo of six torpedoes, the dark shape continued on a course which was bringing it straight toward us. Was it a destroyer coming on for a depth charge attack, having already detected our existence? Even if it was not, it would be difficult to score a torpedo hit if it came straight on over the top of us. I had some bad moments when thinking it might be a destroyer. In the darkness of the conning tower, it was impossible to tell the colour of the people's faces, and if the others detected that the captain was feeling uneasy... They could only surmise this from his voice. We couldn't estimate the range since we didn't know the class of ship. We couldn't yet hear anything on the hydrophones. The round black spot gradually became triangular in shape. The time was 11.9pm. Six torpedoes would be fired. I decided to fire from all tubes in one salvo. At the same time, I ordered the crew of Chiton 6 to embark and number 5 to stand by. The triangular shape gradually got bigger, it was still making straight for us. At this rate it would pass right over us. It was difficult to estimate the range as we couldn't see the height of the mast. It was necessary to know range, course and speed of the target in order to aim and obtain a hit. For the most part the captain at the periscope had to make the necessary estimate. In the case of a merchant ship, one could get the course and speed by following up astern, obtaining the range by radar but using it meant changing giving away one's position to the enemy before firing, and it was difficult to know when to use it. If the class of ship were known, its speed, of course, could be deduced by counting the engine revolutions with the hydrophones. Anyway, many possible errors were involved, and in order to ensure a hit, the error had to be kept as small as possible, and the salvo of six torpedoes had to be fired fanwise. As there were changes in course and speed, the time of firing had to be determined in advance, and this was especially difficult at night. It was possible, however, in conditions of not less than half moon, the target began to assume the appearance of a large warship, and the uppermost part of the triangular black spot had resolved itself into two portions. There was a large mast forward. We've got her, I thought. The fact that the enemy was now visible in two distinct portions made it less likely that she would pass right over us, and the class of ship was now apparent. I was able to assess the masthead height as 90 feet. She was either a battleship or large cruiser. 
the range fell to 4,000 yards. The expected range at time of firing 2,000 yards and the bearing green 45 degrees were set. A hydrophone report gave the enemy speed as moderately high. I used this estimate for the moment, but visual observation didn't put it so high, and I altered the setting to 20 knots. As for the Catons, I had been so occupied with the ordinary torpedoes that I hadn't given the orders for standing by to launch, though the Chiton crews kept coming to ask about it. A Chiton attack at this stage of the moon would be difficult, and I was determined not to use them unless the ordinary torpedo attack failed. We had the moon behind us, and the enemy ship was now clearly visible. She had two turrets aft and a large tower mast. I took her to be an Idaho-class battleship. The crew were all agog, awaiting the order to fire the torpedoes. All was dead quiet. In such circumstances, the eyes of the boat were in the captain's head, and the hydrophones supplied the ears. Without him, the crew could know nothing of what was going on outside. They waited tensely for the next order. Questions kept coming from the Chiton crews. What about the enemy? Where's the enemy? Why can't we be launched? The favourable moment for firing was approaching. I altered the setting of the director to green 60 degrees, range 1500 yards, and began the approach for firing. At last, in a loud voice, I gave the order, Stand by fire! The torpedo release switch pressed at intervals of two seconds, and then the report came from the torpedo room, all tubes fired and correct. Six torpedoes were speeding fanwise toward the enemy ship. I took a quick look through the periscope, but there was nothing else in sight. Bringing the boat onto a course parallel with the enemy, we waited anxiously. Every minute seemed like an age. Then on the starboard side of the enemy by the forward turret, and then by the after turret there rose columns of water, to be followed immediately by flashes of bright red flame. Then another column of water rose from alongside number two turret and seemed to envelop the whole ship a hit, a hit, I shouted as each torpedo struck home and the crew danced round with joy. There was still nothing else in sight and the enemy was stopped but still afloat. I raised the day periscope and gave the conning tower crew a sight. Soon came the sound of a heavy explosion, far greater than that of the actual hits. Three more heavy explosions followed in quick succession then six more. The crew, not realising the cause, were shouting, Depth charge attack! So I hastily reassured them that it was our target exploding, and that there was no other enemy in sight. I saw several flashes aboard the enemy, but she showed no signs of sinking. I therefore stood by to give her a second salvo. From the chitons came the cry, Since the enemy won't sink, send us. The enemy certainly presented an easy target for them in spite of the dark, but what if she should sink before the Catons reached her? Once launched, they were gone for good, and it seemed a pity to risk wasting them. I therefore decided not to use them this time. I intended to take my time, but a report came that the enemy was using her underwater detector apparatus, no doubt trying to get our range. Realising that the enemy would make good contact, I decided to dive deep while reloading for the second salvo, and I lowered the periscope, relying on the hydrophones and underwater detector apparatus to keep track of the enemy. In actual fact, we heard after the war that she was just on the point of sinking, but at the time this was still in doubt. We had certainly scored hits with three torpedoes, but these had so far failed to sink her. Next another report came that the sound of the detector apparatus had ceased. As we were reloading, there was a list on the boat, and it would be dangerous to rise to periscope depth. As soon as reloading was completed, we surfaced and raised the periscope only to find there was nothing to be seen. I made for the spot where I thought she would have sunk, but still couldn't see anything. However, it was over an hour since the first action, and I was certain now that she had sunk. A ship so damaged could not have got away at high speed. Even had she got away, she would still have been in sight. I wanted, however, some proof that she had definitely sunk, but it was difficult to spot any flotsam in the darkness. With feelings of regret, I made off to the northeast for fear of reprisals from ships or aircraft, which might have been in company with our late enemy, and after running on the surface for an hour, we dived to prepare for the next encounter. The ship we had sunk turned out to be the Indianapolis. We got no further opportunities for some time, and while the morale of the crew was good, despite the many hardships, the Chiton crews couldn't be pacified. 
One of them was very resentful, he demanded, with tears in his eyes. Why the chitons couldn't have been used for a good target like a battleship. So I tried to calm him down by saying that there would soon be another good target. At length, on the 30th, we celebrated our haul of the previous day with our favourite rice with beans, boiled eels and corned beef, all of it tinned. On August, one we were ordered by signal to take a northerly direction and altered course accordingly. Thinking that they would be good hunting grounds for shipping, I decided to investigate conditions on the Okinawa Ulithi and then Okinawa Leyte routes. At noon that day we submerged and lay in wait for the enemy, but there was nothing to do, so we surfaced at 3pm and went farther north. We used the sound apparatus with meticulous care and searched frequently with the periscope, but nothing came in sight. We had surfaced and were making northward at 12 knots on the surface when we sighted a mast on the horizon. A look through the periscope revealed the hull, bridge and funnels of a ship, which I estimated to be eight or ten thousand tons. It was a westbound, unescorted merchant ship. The range was twenty thousand yards, and we were slightly before her starboard beam. We increased speed to fifteen knots, but the range gradually increased. Though we increased to full speed, we were unable to get ahead of the fast enemy ship. I-58 had been fitted with small engines, the double-acting diesels with which the rest of the class was equipped, having been turned down on the score of production difficulties. Ballast made up for loss of weight, how we bemoaned the deficiency in Japan's industrial resources, and I recalled the speed of 23 knots at which submarine I-24 had cruised in the Hawaiian area. The moon was on the wane, so even if we came up with the enemy there would be no hope of getting in an attack at night time, if possible, therefore, the enemy had to be captured by day. On the 2nd, we had a radio intelligence report from the Yawata Communications Unit, heavy enemy wireless telegraphy traffic indicating large enemy warships searching for wreck. It was by then some three days or more since we had sunk the Indianapolis, and we didn't realise that these signals were in fact concerned with her. We learned after the war that the captain and 315 of the crew had been rescued, at the time I thought it probable that rescue would be effected, for they had had ample time to radio their consorts before the ship actually sank. It was, I think, August 7 when we received a press report announcing the great damage at Hiroshima by only one bomb. The diving officer, Submarine Lieutenant Nishimura, who normally listened in to the American news, pointed out that these could be no ordinary bombs, but I made no attempt to listen to him nor did I want to do so, for it was lowering to morale. We on board were in no position to assess the situation. Our job was to continue the fight according to our orders and do our utmost to inflict damage on the enemy. Had I listened to the foreign broadcasts, I would probably have realised that it was the atom bomb. In about March 1944, Dr Tanaka had announced the existence of the bomb in the Diet, and since then we had been dreaming of the possibility of achieving it as the one means of recovery. Had we known that the enemy had already developed this weapon, our morale would have sunk and the will to fight would have evaporated. It was probably better that we remained in ignorance. From another point of view, it is very dangerous to fight without knowing about new enemy weapons and their capabilities. In other words, it was necessary for senior officers only to listen to enemy broadcasts, and for them to be stout-hearted enough not to let such news worry them. Unfortunately, my nerves were not capable of standing the strain. Apparently, when the B-29 took off from Tenyon in the Marshalls with the atom bomb for Hiroshima, the crew had heard about the sinking of the Indianapolis, which had brought a portion of the bomb from the United States of America to Tenyon, and they wrote on the side of the bomb a present for the souls of the Indianapolis crew. This story I found in March 1949, in a magazine article entitled The Atom Bomb Unit to a Point Over Hiroshima, the atom bomb was said to have several components. Most of these were transported by aircraft, but the large and heavy section was transported by the Indianapolis. It was over 20 days since we had taken out from Kura, and we were all pretty dirty. We had few changes of even summer clothing, and we wore the same things day and night. There was no water with which to do any laundry, and in any case there was no place to dry the clothes. If they weren't properly dried, the dampness inside the boat made them very sticky, and this was dangerous with a lot of electrical gear about. After sinking the Indianapolis, which we had thought to be an Idaho-class battleship, 
I-58 made her way north. On August 9, an atom bomb similar to the one dropped at Hiroshima was dropped at Nagasaki. The damage suffered by the Japanese mainland was becoming rapidly and progressively worse. It was reported, too, that the Soviet Union had joined in the fight against Japan. The determination was still there, but there was little we could do. However, the morale on board I-58 was very good. While submerged during the forenoon of August 10, our sound detector picked up an echo. I raised the periscope and found there was a destroyer some way off. I ordered the crews of five and six chitons to stand by. The range was about 7,000 yards, and the enemy was zigzagging. There was a hitch in getting six launched as she was running cold and sending up foaming white bubbles. The sea was calm, and there was a risk of being sighted by the destroyer if we hung about under these conditions, so I gave the order to stop the engine. This took some time. When I looked through the periscope, the foam had not dispersed. It was giving away our position. The chitons' engines were making a rattling sound, and I was sure we had been sighted. As I waited impatiently, the engine suddenly stopped. I didn't raise the periscope, expecting a depth charge attack. When moments passed and no attack developed, I decided to take a look, and to my surprise the destroyer was now farther off. Her nearest position had been about 5,000 yards, but no doubt in the excitement I had failed to notice that she had moved away. In fact, since the advent of chitons, enemy destroyers had not been quite so confident as before. In the meantime, the captains of three and four chitons had embarked. Number three was found to be defective. So far, only five had been launched. She was making toward the destroyer. As another destroyer and a convoy now put in an appearance, four was launched. She penetrated the convoy right in front of the destroyer, and with the sound of the explosion, the whole convoy was thrown into confusion. On hearing the sound of another explosion, I looked through the periscope to see that the first destroyer had disappeared, indicating that she too had been sunk. Having prayed for our departed warriors, we surfaced and made off to the north. That night, while we were diving, avoiding enemy aircraft, we picked up a sound on the detector apparatus. It was a pitch-black night. It was probably a merchant ship, as the sound was that of a piston engine. The chitons had been warned to stand by, but it was too dark to use them. Next we picked up the sound of a destroyer quite close. According to the hydrophones, the merchant ship was a big one, but owing to the darkness we could do nothing. If only there had been a moon, the sound of the approaching destroyer became louder. I determined to turn toward it and lie quiet. The enemy seemed to be turning to starboard, and we followed round toward him, standing by for a depth charge attack. Then the sound was audible all round us, and it seemed he may have found us. Perhaps he was passing over the top of us. All was dead silent within the boat as we waited, however. Nothing transpired and the crisis was over. On August 12 the sea was calm. As we made our way northward on the surface at 12 knots, we picked up enemy radar contact which appeared to be surface radar. We were increasing speed, intending to get ahead of the enemy, when another contact showed up from the same direction. After about a quarter of an hour we sighted a mast and crash-dived. It was 5.16pm when I sighted the enemy, and I gave the order for the Catons and the torpedo tubes crews to stand by. The target was getting nearer and I ordered number three chiton crew embark and stand by for launching. At 5.47pm I identified the enemy as a 15,000 ton seaplane carrier. The chitons were all set at 5.56pm. I gave the order to start up the motors. Two minutes later number three chiton was making for the enemy. His chance had come at last. When I had another look after the launching, there was one destroyer ahead of the target. A little later the merchant ship was still there and as I wondered what had happened, I could see black smoke belching from the ship's funnels. The enemy, having sighted the chiton, was making off with all speed. I could see her zigzagging as she gathered speed. Half an hour passed, then came the sound of an explosion, perhaps a hit, but ten more explosions followed. Clearly the destroyer had turned about and was making a depth charge attack. I was very anxious. My hands were clammy with sweat. At 6.42pm, a large column of water accompanied by volumes of black smoke was seen rising skyward. I unconsciously offered up a prayer. After an instant, there was the sound of a single explosion, when the column of water had subsided and the smoke cleared away. 
There was nothing to be seen of the fleeing merchantman. There was only the destroyer visible, making for the scene of the disaster, one and all experienced feelings of exultation and relief. We prayed for happiness in the future existence of the departed warrior, and then surfaced in the gathering darkness and continued our northward progress. After several days on this course, we came to a point 300 miles from Okinawa. The kills achieved by the Khitans had been reported on each occasion after we had speeded away from the scene of action. Since the Khitan captain was able to use his Pespadili proceeding at 30 knots, a hit was rather an easy matter. Even if sighted at fairly long range, it was impossible for a target whose speed is less than 20 knots to get away. Eventually it would be unnecessary to expend a human life in guiding these craft. Good results could have been achieved with radio control, but it was too late for us to contemplate such developments. We had reached the appalling state of affairs where we had only four big submarines left seven, if three transports were included, and eight obsolete submarines which carried two chitons each. On the evening of August 15, I-58, her crew elated, was running on the surface looking for targets on passage from the vicinity of Okinawa to the Bungo Channel. I was standing on the bridge scanning the horizon in the direction of the setting sun when I was suddenly called to the hatch by the senior wireless rating. I thought I had never seen a man so sad. He looked ready to burst into tears at any minute. Please come down a minute, he said. Reluctantly, I followed him down, and drawing me to a corner of the wardroom, he said, Look what's come. It was a communique announcing the end of hostilities. I felt stunned, but after considering for a moment, I decided it could only be some newspaper stunt, not an official signal. Taking a grip on myself, I said, This may be a broadcast for purposes of a démarche. Destroy it and throw it away. One of the officers standing nearby, who had always been professionally interested in enemy broadcasts, remarked, If it is a démarche, it's a very skilful one. I announced to the crew that we could not make a decision to retire on the strength of a press broadcast. In the absence of official orders, we would continue to fight. I ordered the wireless rating to bring all telegrams to me in the rough, just as they came, and enjoined him that no one else was to be informed. Thus, I decided not to tell the crew about it, for even though it were an official order, no form of carelessness could be permitted while at sea. In a submarine, a mistake by any one of the crew in carrying out their duties when diving or surfacing was more to be feared than the enemy. One mistake might easily bring disaster. So I decided to allow them to carry on, in their elated condition, until we got closer to home waters, where we would no longer need to submerge. While having a talk with the surgeon, I was considerably embarrassed when he said, Aren't we going to hear something rather surprising when we get home? We continued diving and surfacing as occasioned by enemy movements, and did not for one instant relax our vigilance. Thus, we returned to the special craft base on August 17, 1945, I saw a motorboat from shore coming out to us. At last, the final moment had come. Clear lower deck, everybody aft. All the crew assembled aft on the upper deck, which looked rather bare with only the chitin chocks remaining. Then, amid tears, I read aloud the Imperial Dispatch announcing the end of the war. Without another word, I went aboard the motorboat with the messenger and went ashore to report to the senior officer concerning the valiant deeds of our fine chitin warriors, they had not survived to suffer the indignity of defeat. On that day, August 18, 1945, we were met by six Hay-class submarines as we passed through the special submarine training area, and together we returned to Curie. Except for one or two dissentients, most of us were past argument, but there were some who were all for going out to fight. Still, it was all over, and this minority were confusing their hopes with fact. As we made our weary way homeward, there were some aircraft boisterously dropping pamphlets expressing opposition to the ending of hostilities. We, however, upheld the national constitution and laid down our arms in accordance with the imperial order. Let the spirits of the eighty departed warriors of the Khitans and Midgets bear witness. Our country will have to follow a difficult road, and the ordeal imposed by heaven on our nation and people continues. Prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor by our air units under the command of Vice Admiral Nagumo, Japanese submarines were surrounding the island of Oahu 
and sitting astride the United States lines of communication between Hawaii and the American mainland. In addition, preparations were complete for sending five midget submarines to penetrate Pearl Harbor. These submarines, comprising 27 of the latest from the combined fleet submarine units, and under the command of Vice Admiral Shimizu, sailed from Kure and Yokosuka between November 18 and 20, 1941. After taking on fuel and provisions in the marshals, they proceeded as the advanced guard of Admiral Nagumo's striking force, with the primary object of cutting off ships of the enemy fleet, which escaped the consequences of our airstrike, and by stopping reinforcements and supplies from the United States mainland, so rounding off the whole of the Hawaiian operation. In fact, the operations staff in Tokyo expected more from the longer-term submarine warfare than the momentary airstrike. However, the results were entirely contrary to expectation, and only one out of twenty. Seven submarines was able to make any attack. Morrison, in his history, writes, Aggressive patrolling and depth charging by destroyers and other ships on patrol completely nullified the work of the big 1900-ton Japanese submarines. They did not torpedo a single one of the very numerous ships entering and departing from Pearl Harbor and Honolulu. Most of the 20 I-boats deployed south of Oahu returned to Japan within a few days, but about five were ordered to the west coast of the United States of America. One of these, I-170, was sunk by a plane from the USS Enterprise en route, the others sank a few ships off California and Oregon. Thus, the advanced expeditionary force failed completely. It inflicted no damage but lost all five midget submarines and one large one. Furthermore, when they returned to harbour after the operation, both the senior officers of units and captains of submarines reported, It is as follows, the Hawaiian defences are very sound, and the enemy ships in general very much on their guard, making it impossible for submarines to enforce a blockade or cut the lines of communication. Enemy anti-submarine vessels and patrol aircraft kept up a relentless pressure, and although our submarines did sight a few targets, they were counter-attacked before getting a chance to put in their own attack. The submarine is a weapon for attacking merchant ships, that is, its main function is commerce destruction. Both Imperial Headquarters and the Combined Fleet were badly shaken by the results of the submarine operations at Hawaii, and they were bitterly disappointed with their complete failure. As a result, the faith of the Japanese Navy in submarines came to waver. Submarine training based on a war of attrition. In the first place, Japan failed to secure her desired 70% strength vis-à-vis -vis America at the 1922 Washington Naval Treaty, but she calculated to make good this deficiency by means of submarine warfare. Thus came into being the new tactical method peculiar to Japan, attritional warfare. That is to say, our policy was to use submarines to pick off units of the United States fleet as it made its way via Hawaii across the Pacific, and very far-reaching results were expected from such tactics. This policy was strongly advocated by Admiral Suetsugu, who held that the success or failure of these tactics would be the turning point in the decisive battle between the two navies, and he insisted on relentless training to this end. In other countries, the primary use of submarines was in attacking merchant ships and in commerce destruction, attacks on warships being a secondary object. This policy made the best use of the special features of the submarine, and furthermore the loss of valuable cargoes to the enemy was considered of primary importance. Moreover, attacks by submarines on closely escorted fleets were of a very hazardous nature. In Japan, however, the reduction of a heavily escorted United States warship fleet took precedence over all other targets, and intensive training to this end was pursued, and there were frequent and lamentable cases of the sacrifice of submarines on peacetime manoeuvres. Despite these occurrences, the Japanese Navy went ahead with its plans to pierce the heavily escorted ranks of the enemy and achieved the necessary confidence to attack warship targets. In fact, there was a feeling of almost supernatural skill in the competence with which our submarines carried out their attacks in training and on manoeuvres. Under these circumstances, the Japanese Navy expected much from their submarines, and at the same time vastly underrated the capabilities of the American submarines. As the submarine campaign at Hawaii showed, our submarine attacks against warships completely misfired, and the subsequent attacks on merchant ships achieved little. 
As opposed to this, our losses at the hands of United States submarines were very high, and it would not be an overstatement to say that United States submarines dealt Japan a mortal blow. The following announcement was made by Ernest J. King, the chief of United States Naval Staff. United States submarines played a very big part in bringing Japan to submission. 63% of Japanese ships of over 1,000 tons were sunk by submarine, the remaining 37% being accounted for by the other armed forces. The figures estimated by the Japanese Navy for total shipping losses were 1 million tons in the first year of the war and 800,000 tons in each succeeding year. In actual fact, however, the losses were as follows. First year, 1,250,000 tons. Second year, 2,560,000 tons. Third year, 3,480,000 tons. That is more than four times the estimated amount. How did the Japanese Navy come to make such an inaccurate estimate? It was because they underestimated the United States submarines. Naturally enough, the greater proportion of losses was probably expected to be inflicted by submarines. But the greater part of Japan's sea lifelines lay along the routes to the areas of natural resources in the southern seas, comprising the Luchu Islands, Formosa, Philippines, Borneo, Celebes, Java, Sumatra, which were defended by a series of natural barricades. We had thought, therefore, that we could ward off the attacks of enemy submarines by our anti-submarine defences in the comparatively narrow stretches of sea between these various islands. In the first year of the war alone, losses were heavy in connection with our southern advance, and this was probably aggravated by the fact that our anti-submarine measures were undeveloped. But after the second year, we might have expected a decrease in losses, as our defences were then in order, but the United States submarines proceeded to carry all before them. Dr. Jerome Bernard Cohen wrote, The United States blockade of Japan increased in intensity, the supply of raw materials was cut off, and war production was virtually brought to a standstill before the strategic bombing commenced. For this reason, Japan was unable to continue the fight. For every ton she built, Japan was losing three tons by sinking, thus setting at naught her merchant fleet. It was her reliance on the import of raw materials that brought Japan to the brink of misfortune. Matters progressed from bad to worse. The waste in shipping prevented the import of raw materials, and steel production was thereby drastically reduced. This reacted on the shipbuilding industry, and Japan was unable to make good her shipping losses, and she experienced economic strangulation. At the beginning of 1945, she was at death's door, and the air attacks supplied the finishing touches. What was the reason for such a pitiable result? The losses inflicted by United States submarines were not limited to merchant ships. The enemy proceeded to attack our warships with a quite unexpectedly efficient technique. Our losses were stupendous. On June 15, 1944, having heard that the United States forces had landed on Saipan, the Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, Admiral Toyoda, collected together all his available forces with the idea of counter-attacking in a decisive battle and breaking up the enemy plans. One task force under the command of Vice Admiral Ozawa began searching for the enemy from dawn on June 18, and by afternoon had sighted three groups of United States task forces containing six aircraft carriers to the west of Saipan. As the hour was late and the range excessive, he anticipated an action on the following day. At dawn on the 19th, while carrying out a search, he sighted an enemy task force in four groups, and at about 8am and 10am, he launched the first and second attacks respectively. Vice Admiral Ozawa's flagship, the Taiho, was hit by torpedoes from an enemy submarine after launching the first attack and sank with a big explosion six hours later. The aircraft carrier Shikaku also was torpedoed by an enemy submarine at about the same time as the flagship. Vice Admiral Ozawa, despite these losses, determined on a third air attack, but there were less than a hundred aircraft remaining, and that night he retired westward in expectation of action the next morning. On the afternoon of the following day, the 20th, he was attacked by 300 enemy planes. The aircraft carrier Zuikaku was hit by several bombs, and the carrier Hitaka was hit by torpedo bombers, and while drifting out of control, she was torpedoed and sunk by an enemy submarine. 
Thus, Ozawa's squadron was picked off by submarines while engaged in air combat with the enemy task force. These carriers were strongly escorted by destroyers throughout the action, but the United States submarines penetrated our lines without any difficulty and carried out their attacks on large warships. In October 1944, Kurita's fleet was intending to penetrate into Leyte Gulf to keep up the attacks on the enemy. On October 23, while on the lookout at the entrance to the Palawan Channel, the flagship Otago and the Nachi were sunk by a United States submarine, another very serious loss. Furthermore, there were many instances of United States submarines picking off even our anti-submarine vessels, which were charged with the duty of affording protection from submarines. What were the reasons for these deplorable results? They were largely due to our inferiority in the fields of ordnance and ship construction. Our submarines, built and equipped with inferior weapons, were counter-attacked by the enemy before they ever got to their targets or were evaded. Against the superior equipment of the enemy submarines, our ships under attack had no opportunity to counter-attack or evade. Many of them were alive to the enemy's presence only after they were attacked. In the matter of building large-type submarines, Japan was in the lead among the world navies, and had built the 2,000-ton 1 class as compared with the biggest in the American and British navies at 1,500 tons. Furthermore, during the war, Japan built some 3,500-ton submarine aircraft carriers. On six occasions, the superior I-class boats of the Japanese Navy were sent to Germany, and while at the secret German submarine base of Lorient on the Atlantic coast of France, German submarine technicians made detailed inspections – the Germans criticised the excessive hull vibration and the excessive use of underwater signalling devices, etc., which were not conducive to the tricky conditions of underwater warfare. Submarine Wine 39, commanded by Commander Kinashi, was torpedoed and sunk by a United States submarine in the Formosa Strait on her return voyage from Germany. This was entirely due to inferior radar equipment, Captain Kinashi is said to have remarked when he put in at Singapore on this last voyage that he had no worry concerning enemy aircraft and submarines, as the radar equipment had been greatly improved. On hearing of the many deficiencies in Japanese submarines, Hitler presented two German submarines to Japan to serve as models. One of them, with a German crew, arrived at Kura in July 1943, but the other one was sunk in the Atlantic by Allied aircraft, while en route to Japan with a Japanese crew. These German submarines were of the small 750-ton type and were therefore of little value to Japan. The Japanese Navy expected much from its submarines, and for this reason alone both officers and men were carefully selected and put through the most rigorous training. They considered themselves superior in technique in the field of submarine warfare to any in other navies, but when it came to the test of actual warfare, the results were deplorable. At the end of the war, however, it can be said that slight improvements had been effected in the radar and other electrical equipment fitted in the Japanese submarine fleet.